Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. This is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and you'll get notified when I post content each and every week. Uh, looking forward to this interview, my guest is award-winning independent filmmaker, producer, and directed, director Mark Levin. He's here to discuss his latest documentary, It's Basic, which tells the story of several guaranteed income pilot programs, as well as some of the recipients of the program and dispels some of the myths around poverty across the United States. The film has been screened in several major film festivals, including the 2023 Tribeca Film Festival. Mark is also the founder of Blowback Productions, which has been responsible for the creation of over 30 films since 1988, resulting in the prestigious recognition of winning Emmy, DuPont, Peabody, and Cable Aces Awards. Mark, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Ed. Thank you. All right, let's get into it. Um, first of all, how did you first hear about the Guaranteed Income Programs uh, and the Mayor for Guaranteed Income, and uh, what inspired you to want to make this documentary? Well, I, I met Michael Tubbs um, when he was actually just, I think, a 23-year-old city council person uh, in Stockton, California. And then when he got elected mayor uh, in, um, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, 2016, um, I convinced HBO, let's do a documentary. He's the youngest um, mayor elected of a major U.S. city, the first African-American. And his story was compelling. Uh, and we did a film called Stockton on My Mind. Uh, and part of the draw not only was Michael, but that he had the first municipally backed guaranteed income pilot in Stockton, California. I had heard uh, of guaranteed income, basic income. I was familiar uh, with reading about it in Europe and even in Africa, certain uh, experiments and pilots, uh, but it was the first one I had known about in the United States. So those two things attracted me to Stockton. We did this documentary, was nominated for an Emmy, and Michael and I became close. And when he moved to LA after his, uh, he lost re-election, partially because his opponent blamed him for giving taxpayer money to poor people. Uh, of course, that wasn't true. Uh, it was philanthropic dollars at that point uh, that was financing the pilot program that Stockton did that was for, I think, uh, 125 citizens. Uh, but still, um, that uh, was part of the offensive against him. He lost the election and uh, he and his wife moved to LA. He started this Mayors for a Guaranteed Income to spread this idea, got in touch with me again. And uh, the more I looked into it, I was like, wow, Michael, the seed you planted in Stockton has really taken root. I can't believe so many cities are, are, are looking at this, are putting pilots together. And he raised money to seed pilots around the country. Uh, and so we teamed up and said, let's do a documentary on this and let's have it be the participants themselves kind of telling their stories. Because as you said, Edric, in your introduction, there's so many myths about poverty, about uh, social welfare programs, welfare uh, scammers, all of that lazy uh, people don't want to work. They're not going to work. And the little Stockton experiment, which uh, was studied, um, disprove that in, in its small uh, group of citizens. Uh, people actually worked more. People actually were more motivated. Their their physical and mental health approved. It was a positive all around. But still, you got these myths. And uh, um, so the idea that cities across the country were going to do this, but have the citizens who are receiving $500 a month, $1,000 a month in Los Angeles, have them tell their own stories of what this means to them. So that was the beginning of its basic. And as you mentioned, um, ultimately, the Guaranteed Income Program is about improving the lives of real people and their families. Um, telling their stories uh, of real people involves gaining their trust uh, and also allowing them to be vulnerable to tell their stories on screen. So uh, how did you approach that uh, in trying to gain their trust so that you were able to capture the real story so that uh, it came across in the film? Well, that's a good question, Edric, and you're, you're 
right on target there that um, it's all about trust uh, and all about right from the beginning, sitting down with people and saying, look, if you're not going to be willing to share some of the down moments, then the up moments and the triumph aren't going to ring true. Uh, and the difference that this may or may not make in your life is not going to ring true because it's going to look like more of a polished promo piece than a real story. And there was a certain self-selection process each pilot program, and we went to five cities, which is what we focused on, St. Paul, Cambridge, Mass., Newark, New Jersey, Gainesville, Florida, and Los Angeles. Um, and in each community, they had what they called a storytelling cadre. In other words, a group of people who had volunteered to talk to the media that were separated from the larger group that the academics were studying. Um, and so you had a certain self-selection process of people who are willing and, and wanted to tell the story. But honestly, most of them figured that was going to be a brief uh, interview like this or uh, local news or, you know, uh, it wasn't going to be somebody moving into their house or coming back three or four times over a six month period. So it was uh, building friendship, building trust, having them see our work. Um, and I'll be honest, even sharing some of our stories with them that, you know, like if you take one of the couples uh, from St. Paul, Abby and her husband, Anders, at the end of the program, and because we wanted to follow one city from beginning to end. And, you know, we wanted to make it clear, hey, this ends. And, you know, where do people go when the money, the extra money stops? And for this family, they moved out of their apartment and they moved in with their parents, with uh, Anders' parents. And they felt a little self-conscious, understandably, you know, like this is humiliating. Even in the film, I think Andrew says something. It feels like we're on parole, you know, that we really, you know, aren't successful adults. You know, we got to move it back in with our parents. So I, I, I shared with them a story of my family and, and my daughter, who is successful professional, works at the Metropolitan Museum, her husband's professor at Bard. Uh, and I said, but, you know, they couldn't save up enough money to, to, to get a place here in New York City. It's so expensive. And uh, so my wife and I said, move back with us for a year or two so you can save money. Uh, and I said, you know, look, these are, 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 you know, accomplished professionals and they're dealing with the same thing you are. You shouldn't feel embarrassed, humiliated. This is the world we live in now. Uh, and it's important you tell the story. So, um but you're right. It takes trust. And that was, um, you know, the whole team that I worked with was key in building that trust. Uh, in addition to the the subjects of the film, the, the people whose lives are uh, affected by this program, uh, you also had to talk to program administrators and politicians and a host of other folks uh, who are responsible for administering this program. Um, what are some of the things you learned from them that you may not have known before you started this film? Well, I think, you know, I'm not, I wasn't as familiar with the bureaucracy, the social welfare bureaucracy. Um, and obviously that is uh, tedious and a burden at times for a lot of people from the administrators and the, and the civil servants um, who deal with it uh, to the recipients. And obviously, one of the advantages of this approach uh, is that it cuts out all the red tape and the bureaucracy. You're getting a check. You've got a card. You know, it's direct deposit in your bank account. Uh, and um, so kind of meeting both in the municipal governments, people who have dealt with social services, and of course their commitment too. You see, you know, people are so easily labeled, oh, they're just bureaucrats, oh, they're just paper pushers. There's so many people that work uh, on the front lines, whether it's a municipal government or nonprofits that coordinate a lot of these programs, the municipal government subcontracts it to nonprofits. So many dedicated people uh, doing heroic work and they're either ignored, underpaid, and certainly underappreciated as we, you know, basically, you know, dismiss them as kind of just drones 
that really aren't doing anything except wasting our hard-earned taxpayer money. So I, I think that's the big takeaway is that there are a lot of good people in both city government. Yes, there's waste. Yes, there's fraud. Yes, there's corruption. You know, all of those things are real. But um, it sometimes eclipses how many people are out there actually trying to help. And what's related to that is it, and this, again, was just by chance and the people that volunteered. But a, a good number of the ca main characters in the film are providing services to other people, whether it's healthcare services, whether it's Lucille, the, the school bus driver, uh, teachers. You see how little we as culture value people who help other people. Exactly. If you make money or if you invent technology, obviously those are the high paying jobs or even in the entertainment sports, you know, but when you're out there every day helping people, educating people, uh, supporting people, uh, it's sad. As as again, uh, Abby says, you know, uh, I take care of people all day, and then what do I have left for my own family? Um, so that was a wake up. Uh, you're not just putting out a film and moving on to your next project. You're actually uh, starting a campaign around this film uh, called the Guaranteed Guaranteed Income Works Tour. Um, tell me about that, and uh, what are some of the goals of the tour? Well, the goal of the tour is to really uh, spread the dialogue and and dispel the mythology. The film is part of that, but it's in combination with getting civic leaders, uh, both political, social, educational leaders, panels, uh, town halls. Uh, it's to basically open the American public and also the American voters mind to this is something we got to start thinking about. On one side, there's poverty and the inequality of wealth, huge issues. But on the other side, there's technology and the disappearance maybe of nine to five work the way we've known it all our lives, you know, with AI coming in and uh, big backers of uh, some of these discussions, our technology, people, philanthropists, etc. So this is a discussion that has to start. And, uh, you know, Michael and the network of, of Mayors for Guaranteed Income realized, obviously, this year we're moving into 2024, huge election that we're facing. Uh, huge headwinds, you know, in, in, the, in the world where it's at. So to be able to have a grassroots kind of discussion movement about really how should the economy work better? How do we deal with the fact that, as the statistic in the film, that over 60 percent of Americans basically live paycheck to paycheck? So if something happened, an accident, an illness, um, you know, having to take care of a relative, they could be out on the street. Uh, and coming out of COVID, the one thing that the COVID pandemic, one of the many things that I think it fundamentally did was it reminded us why we have government, <laughs> why we have, in other words, all of a sudden everything stopped. That was like, how are we going to eat? How are we going to pay for anything? How are we going to pay for our rent? What are we going to do? And it was, it was a Republican governor. And, and President Trump that signed those first checks and went out to everybody and all of a sudden was like, wow, the government helped us. Surprise, surprise, with everybody screaming about how bad the government, and, and this idea, which has been around for a while, and in the film we talk a little of the history of the idea, and the support in the 60s, Martin Luther King, and on the conservative side, Milton Friedman, Richard Nixon, but all of a sudden the door opened for, wow, the government can send out checks. You know, when Andrew Yang was going around, you know, mm -hmm. people were like, oh, that's crazy. But all of a sudden, that wasn't so crazy. We were living through it. Um, so that, I think this was, how do we ride that out? How do we keep that dialogue going? That people open their minds to their different ways the, the government can play a role. And obviously, guaranteed income versus universal basic income. Universal basic income is everybody gets something. Guaranteed income is let's target it. Let's start at least with those who need it most. Um, and that's what these pilots are. And unfortunately, as I say, 
over half our country, 60% of our country, $500 a month for people living paycheck to paycheck. It's a little money. It can make a world of difference. As Lucille, the main character in this story from St. Paul, the, the school bus driver says, she says, put a little gas in my tank and I'll show you how far I can go. So it's trying to popularize that idea and make it so, I mean, I'm just looking at, before we got on the phone, I was just looking at this social security panel that are trying to set up the new speaker of the house to cut, you know, social security. Uh, I mean, so there's still this push that, you know, we're giving too much to poor people, to people of color, to immigrants, to all, you know, instead of this consciousness uh, that did come out for a moment in the COVID epidemic, that, hey, by helping everyone, we're helping ourselves. You know, by having a healthier, better educated community, it helps everybody. You know what? We want to end up in a world where the, the super wealthy, the one percent live in their gated communities, have private police forces. You know, I mean, basically third world countries, you know, drive in armored cars so the kids aren't kidnapped, you know, or a fairer, more equitable, but ultimately healthier, more productive society and culture. So how do you start that conversation? Uh, to Michael's credit and to Melvin Carter's and uh, Mayor Siddiqui and Ross Baraka, some of these mayors are now saying, hey, you can get totally depressed looking at the news every night and reading the newspaper about what's happening in Washington. But in communities across this country, there are people trying to come up with innovative ways to deal with this issue of economic insecurity, of economic inequality, of poverty. And the bottom line is that poverty is not a force of nature. It's not just natural forces. It's a policy decision that we've made as a culture. We're a wealthy enough culture that we don't need to have as many poor people as we do. Every other advanced industrial country gives money to young families with young children. That's a given. Canada, Great Britain, France, every other advanced industrial country has universal health care. Every other advanced industrial country does more to allow their, their, their citizens to go into higher education without going into debt that will cripple them for years. So I'm saying, how, how do we restart that dialogue uh, we've been so locked into kind of a reaction to the 60s, the civil rights movement, the Great Society, everything that came out of that, the Reagan market fundamentalist, Thatcher. You know, we've been in that era, even Clinton and Obama. You know, we've been living in that scarcity mode. And, and, and COVID did allow a change in perspective. How do we build on that, that it's about community? It's not about, as, as Ronald Reagan famously said, you know, government is the enemy. No, government can be an ally if used properly. I remember that Club for Growth comment, I believe. Uh, government, they wanted to take it and drown it in a bathtub, uh, which is unbelievable uh, cruelty, if you think of it that way. Right. Um, but... Uh, but work like yours and and what you guys are doing, I think, will help further that dialogue. So I applaud you for that because it is a much needed conversation. Um, which leads me to my next question, which is about your your production company. Um, uh, I'm blanking it. Blow oh, back Blowback Park. Productions. Thank you, Blowback Productions. Um, you've been very successful. You and your partner Daphne Pinkerson have uh, created some very memorable content, award winning content, uh, things that last. Um, how did you start blowback and um is there an underlying core philosophy of the projects you take on because there seems to be a, a greater good for some of the work that you guys are doing yeah i would say that there is you know that um you know we have certainly social justice the criminal justice system um economic uh, inequality, you know, uh, we are socially conscious uh, storytellers, no doubt about it. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, my own personal history, you know, my parents were labor organizers involved in the civil rights movement. So I'm sure that had a, a profound impact. And I'm a child of the 60s. 
so I came of age uh, in that turbulent time, and and I've kind of felt that it's been mischaracterized and this whole reactionary movement that started in the late seventies, you mentioned the club growth that this whole business is the answer that, you know, the market is the, is the only true way that we've kind of lived with. I've, I've fought against that. I don't believe that. And, and, and mischaracterizing the sixties is, is that's what set us back. And that's, that's, that's the problem you know, is we gave too many people too many rights and 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 gave people the idea that you know we could help them. Uh, these these are you know mistakes. No, I don't believe they're mistakes. Uh, uh, and so I think it's animated me. And having lost a few friends uh, along the way, you know, in the madness of of that era, I think all those things. Uh, certainly, the war on drugs is a central theme in our work. The mistake, in other words, that we went to war here on, on our own people uh, for a good forty or fifty years. It's ironic that it was Trump who actually signed the First Step Act, which was really the first federal reversal in the war on drugs since Nixon declared it back in the early seventies. But that certainly is something close to home and the culture that I grew up in and that put so many people in prison. And so we've done a, a whole bunch of films of people behind bars and, and the film I did uh, 25 years ago that won Sundance uh, and the camera door can slam is going to be re-released this and uh, um, this winter or spring. Um, so, uh, that's exciting. What's kind of, uh, sad is that it, <laughs> we played it at Sundance last January and there were a lot of young people who had never seen it. And they were like, Oh, I would have thought that film was shot last summer if there hadn't been a flip phone in it. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, that has been part of it. Uh, and you know, the, the climate now, it's funny. Um, obviously, documentaries, uh, so-called nonfiction work is more popular than ever. There are more of it everywhere. It's, 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 it's a commercially viable way to make a life, you know, to be a documentary filmmaker, to be in this uh, side of the business. At the same time, social issues, people are, are, are maybe even touchier about. You know, I just went to a documentary last night about book banning. And it's like, you know, executives, oh, we don't want to do anything that, you know, is going to get the crazies over here or is going to get the hate mail coming or on social media or I'm afraid, you know, they're going to start tracking me out of my home or, you know, so it's a, it's a kind of mixed bag. Like this film alone that we're talking about, this grassroots um, campaign is fantastic. The responses have been, you know, just uh, just fascinating. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, we've been very lucky working with all the major distributors and obviously we've shown it to a number of them and the, Oh, this is moving. It's important, uh, compassionate, but it's not right for us. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting time in, in that way. Uh, but it's, uh, I often joke, you know, I was born in New York city, uh, and so I was riding the subways, you know, when I was an infant, and that probably scrambled my head some way that said, hey, you know, this is the way you're going. That's the way I'm going. Uh, another film you did, uh, which uh, is titled Protocols of Zion, uh, you shed light on post 9-11 anti-Semitism. Um, as you sit here now in 2023, um, What's your thoughts on that? Because a, a lot of the themes in that film are still relevant today and even more so because of the rise in anti-Semitism over the last several years. Absolutely. I'm glad you asked me that question because I'm currently trying to get the film re-released, Protocols Design. It was it was on HBO, but it was distributed by Think Films that went bankrupt. And so their whole library went into what's called a liquidity library, which means they just lock these films up in a vault uh, until their licensing uh, contract is over. So I'm trying to convince the, the the company that does that, you know, what, what are you doing? I mean, especially at a moment like this, this film should be out. It's not about money. If it was money, I'll give it to you. Still, oh, no, we can't. But I'm I just found out last night, it's funny you asked me that, about um, a group of of lawyers that have kind of put together um, 
uh, an effort to get films that are like that and are very relevant to speaking to the issues of the moment out of the so-called liquidity vault. Uh, I think that Protocols of Zion should be shown. I, I put it on YouTube. I tried. They took it down. Um, I'm I'm heartbroken by what's happening because, uh, in fact, right after it happened, uh, Mehdi Hassan, uh, who's a, a Egyptian American in Protocols of Zion, who had a restaurant in Patterson, uh, and is I met and became good friends with. He called me up immediately after the horror of October seventh, the Hamas massacre. And then the war, uh, the Israeli invasion of Gaza and said, Mark, you and I need to show that film and you and I need to stand together as a Jew and a Muslim, you know, that we're friends. We became close when you made protocols uh, and more important now than ever. I think the confusion on both sides is that if you support the Palestinians, which I do, in terms of a two-state solution, in terms of the Palestinians uh, deserve their own self-determination. Um, but Hamas is, a, in my mind, a terrorist organization, and not just a terrorist organization, it's a fundamentalist organization that, you know, is misogynist, is anti-gay, is, you know, it's, it's, it's out of the fundamentalists, whether it's Muslim, fundamentalist Christian, or fundamentalist Jews. Now, that's the other side, which is the tragedy, is that the, the Netanyahu government is made up of Jewish supremacists. Uh, and that's frightening. And, and you've got to get rid of Netanyahu. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but how do you do that? How do you get rid of Hamas and rid of Netanyahu when both of them, in a way, want war to continue because it means that they continue? So it's I lived in Israel uh, many years ago, right after the Yom Kippur War, as I said, this is just, it's just horrible. Um, and I hope that this ceasefire can last. And, and, and honestly, I have to say that as an American Jew, when I first went over, just as I was stunned after 9-11 to hear these rumors spreading that no Jews died at the World Trade Center. That's what started Protocols of Zion. I was like, what, are you kidding me? Uh, oh, yeah, I read it all. You read it all where? Oh, the Protocols of Zion was written 100 years ago. And I knew what the protocols were. This forgery uh, uh, in Tsarist Russia that Henry Ford then picked up on and Hitler later picked up on. But uh, the people were believing this just stunned me. Uh, and I went, when I first went as a young man to Israel in 1973, in the spring of 73, for the first, for the 25th anniversary of the uh, state of Israel, I was stunned. I had never seen Jewish fundamentalists. I'd seen religious Jews. But a friend of mine brought me to a rally uh, in Jerusalem, mostly black hats, you know, Orthodox, but some of what was the, just the beginning of the settler movement. Uh, and and Begin was was not he, he was considered an extremist at that at this point. He been, went on to become the prime minister. But I heard Jews chanting for blood uh, and chanting for the land on the West Bank that it was in the Bible promised to the Jewish people. And I was stunned as a as a New York Jew. I was like, wait a second, you know, they yeah, they're fundamentalist Christians, and you know the Crusaders, and there's fundamentalist Muslims, you know, Al-Qaeda and, you know, but not Jews. Oh, yes, and Jews. And, and tragically, some of those very people and their, maybe their children, are key elements of the Netanyahu coalition, which is just a disaster. Uh, and part of how this all happened uh, in their messianic belief that the West Bank is biblically there's, you know, um, so all that to say, it's hard for me to watch the news. I would like to get protocols out there. I think showing that Jews and Muslims here in the United States uh, can get together and they do in Israel also. <laughs> but of course, this is eclipsed by the fact that the extremists uh, just gained power. And it's something we got to deal with here, too. Uh, you know, in terms of the extremism and, you know, these three Palestinians shot in Burlington, horrible, 
just horrible. And the, and the rise of anti-Semitism and the reemergence of the protocols. In other words, they, oh, the Jews control everything. They control the media. They control the finances. And uh, yeah, uh, so um, I hope I can get the film back out there and use it as a way to just have a dialogue because the solution is uh, it's it's obviously not an easy one uh, because yeah you can go back to sixty seven you can go back to forty eight but hey having lived in Jerusalem you know you basically go all the way back uh, two thousand years three thousand years that that spot uh, Mount Moriah that 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 place is the most conquered piece of real estate in, in on the earth it's changed hands more empires, more conquerors. So, uh, you know, you're going back to Cain and Abel, uh, you know, and Ishmael uh, and uh, uh, Isaac. Uh, it's a blood feud that is just, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, very painful. And and on the news 24-7. Uh, but so hopefully there can be some dialogue and some, some peace, uh, which I think a lot of folks, including myself, uh, would like to see uh, nobody wants to see war. Um, so hopefully there can be some no, and, resolution. Yeah, uh, absolutely. 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 Uh, well, thank you for sharing such, uh, such insights uh, because I think more of that is needed. Um, my last question for you. And first of all, thank you so much for coming on the edge show. I really appreciate your conversation. Uh, and I really appreciate you sharing your perspective with all of my listeners. Um, if people want more information uh, about you, about blowback productions, uh, or the film, uh, and, and is it is it going to be on cable? Is it going to be in the theaters? Uh, where can they get? Where can they see the film? And where can they get more information about you and Blowback Productions? Okay, so it's basic. Um, it's got a website. Uh, it's basic. Uh, uh, so I, you know, in terms of where the film is going to be next, it just played in Birmingham, I think, uh, last night or the night before. So it is on this national tour. And so go to the It's Basic documentary website or the uh, Mayors for a Guaranteed Income website, you know, which you'll have. So while it's on this tour, it's not going to be available yet uh, in a streaming platform or we haven't yet made a deal with a, 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 a streamer or a cable operator. Uh, but we are working on that. The educational market is also, uh, we've made a deal with, so we're starting to get it to universities, colleges, and even high schools. Uh, as far as blowback, blowbackproductions.com, you know, we have a website. You can see our work. You can reach out to us if you, you know, because some of our films, um, are not available because of licensing deals for music or in this case, like uh, Protocols of Zion. Uh, but we're very much about uh, sharing our films, especially with nonprofit groups, educational groups. You know, we have all our films so that if there are certain films that are available commercially uh, through our website, you can reach out to us. And if you want to have a community screening or an educational screening, you know, we're just not looking for people to make money on films, you know, that we don't, you know, necessarily own the licensing. But if it's being used in a socially positive or educational way, we're all there to support it and get you a version. Of it. Excellent. Well, Mark, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to me here on The Edric Show. I really appreciate our conversation and I hope uh, we can talk again. All right, Edric, I appreciate your very intelligent and, uh, you know, thought out questions. And uh, I'm going to tune into some of your other shows now uh, to see what you've been talking about. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Have a great this, day. You too. This has been another edition of The Edric Show. I am your host, Edric Jerome. As promised, this is the place for intelligent conversation with interesting people. Hit that notification bell. Go ahead and subscribe. You'll get notified of content each and every week. I want to thank you for tuning in and I will catch you on the next episode. Oh,